Hello again, and welcome to Breaking Down Civil War II. This is part four in an ongoing series. My name is Samuel Culper. We're going to start off with the obligatory caveat on predictions. No one can predict what's going to happen in the future. We're talking about very complex things, potentially far in the future. There's an incalculable number of variables. But what we can do is begin looking at the evidence. And we can begin reducing uncertainty about the future and deciding what is more likely to happen, what is less likely to happen. Here are my thoughts on what I think is more likely and what I think is less likely. In part four, we are discussing the concept of insurgency versus civil war. I'm going to talk about the phases of revolutionary conflict, and I'm going to answer the question, where are we now? In part five, I'm going to look at some military and law enforcement implications of what I think is going to happen, and I will try to produce that in the next couple weeks. Now, one reason why I don't like the term civil war is because it's a pretty vague term, and it conjures up a lot of different ideas and definitions about exactly what a civil war is. If you want to be very vague and say that a civil war is a war between citizens of the same country, then yeah, we'll have a civil war. It's already started, which is a point that I've made early on. But if we want to take that definition a step further and be a little more specific, then we would say that a civil war is a war between two organized groups in an interstate conflict. And I say that we're not going to have this kind of civil war because I question a number of things. But one thing I question is just how organized these two sides are going to be. If this were purely a left versus right conflict, then we might call this a civil war. If this were a war between Republican forces and Democrat forces for political supremacy and dominance over the country, or a war between federal forces and separatist forces, then we might be able to call this a quote unquote civil war. But it's not just two sides. This coming conflict is going to have racial and ethnic elements, political and ideological elements, class elements. We might refer to this as a circular firing squad because it's not going to be as clean as Democrats versus Republicans. And we're already seeing already in this conflict that it's just not that simple. Now, in the first video, I said I didn't think that we were going to have two organized sides, millions of people on each side fighting for control over the country. That's traditionally how we would view a civil war. I said, I didn't think that we were going to have state by state, clear and hold type of warfare. And this is not going to be conventional, which is to say that we are unlikely to see tanks and bombers and other elements of high end, high intensity conflict. Instead, what I described, what are probably best viewed as regional conflicts, not necessarily broken down by Democrats versus Republicans, but broken down by racial lines and ideological and political lines, class lines, so on and so forth. What I expect to happen in the future are conflicts at the state and regional level, which I've explained in previous videos. What I believe is going to happen is that red states are going to refuse to obey the orders of a leftist federal government. And you have a state that's 60%, 80% Republican, conservative, or right-leaning. You have a leftist federal government that infringes on the Second Amendment or that creates laws that are otherwise unpalatable or morally unconscionable for these conservatives and Republicans. And these states are going to disregard those laws. And this is mainly a political conflict led by governors and state legislatures that pass laws nullifying these federal laws. And then you're going to have a federal government that now has to enforce those laws, which may not happen. And it's really, I mean, too early to tell exactly how this might play out in any given state. On the flip side, you're going to have blue states that are going to enforce or help enforce these federal laws from this leftist government. And that's where you're going to see a majority of the actual conflict. And if we really want to get into definitions, then what I see is far more likely than millions of Americans on opposing sides fighting for control over the government is, quote, organized use of subversion and violence to seize, nullify, or challenge political control of a region. What we're probably going to see is that states controlled by Democrats have a tough time enforcing those laws in areas where there's substantial traditional conservative political power, i.e. at the local or county level. And we're already seeing this in a lot of states, especially in the West, like Washington, Oregon, these state governments have passed these draconian gun laws. And you have sheriffs who say, we're not going to enforce this law. 
or if these laws get passed, we're not going to enforce these laws. And the question is, if a law is not enforced, is it even still really a law? So I think this low intensity conflict is far more likely to remain at the county and state level than it is to expand into this national level civil war. I mean, how many Americans during this very difficult time in American history, how many Americans are going to leave their homes and families behind, left to uncertain dangers, in order to go gallivanting across the United States or invade some other state or otherwise participate in these battles? Uh, because these fights aren't going to be in Nebraska. These fights aren't going to be waged in northern Alabama. And so I see a lot of commenters on my previous video saying, oh, we're going to stand up for the Second Amendment. We're not going to allow this to happen. It's like, well, if you live in a really red area, you're not going to have a fight on your doorstep. You're going to have to go somewhere else. And as long as we're talking about some massive scale conflict, we're talking about massive economic disruptions. We're talking about potentially hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars in wealth essentially evaporating because we have a stock market crash or because people get very defensive and they withdraw their money from the markets and you know so on and so forth. You know, another question I ask is how many people are going to leave an area where they are comfortable, where they know the lay of the land and they know the people who inhabit it to go fight in another area or in another place that's completely foreign and where they don't know anybody. So when I say that violence is going to be at the local county and state level, I'm talking about locals gathering up their torches and pitchforks and ejecting opposing political parties and the action arms that enable political control for this area. In other words, I think this is far more likely to be a thousand brush fires in politically contentious states and areas rather than two opposing forces battling for control over the country. And so I want to clarify that in, in, in hindsight, I probably should have led with that or been much more specific in the first video. Now we're going to get into guerrilla warfare and this is just a brief overview, but first we have to differentiate between conventional and unconventional war. Conventional war, things like troops, tanks, planes, we're talking about high end, high intensity warfare, World War I, World War II, very much conventional conflicts. And then we get into unconventional warfare. And we're not necessarily talking about uniformed personnel or, or uniformed troops. We're not talking about neat little stovepiped command structures of brigades and battalions and companies and so on and so forth. Unconventional warfare is an umbrella term that includes guerrilla warfare, what some people call irregular warfare, which refers to militias, irregular units, really civilians who take up arms or paramilitary units who take up arms, many of whom probably have no formal military training. And then this also encompasses asymmetric warfare. If you lack formal military power, maybe you'll fly a plane into your enemy's air wing and take out their fighter jets. Or Maybe you'll organize protests and foment civil unrest in a country until that president withdraws from the war and you win and they lose. And there's an imbalance of power here, an imbalance of military power. So instead of fighting conventionally, where you are certainly going to lose, you say, we'll just resort to asymmetric means in order to carry out our political will. And I think that this low intensity conflict is going to be much more unconventional than conventional. So we're talking about guerrilla warfare, and I want to explain that it's much more than just my hit and run tactics. That's become cemented in the popular imagination, and most people boil it down to being that simple. But if you truly expect small insurgencies to happen, and you expect those people to carry out guerrilla warfare, then we really have to understand it at a much deeper level. Now, the textbook definition is to reduce the enemy's combat effectiveness by disrupting his war-making capability and weakening his will to resist. Okay, great. What does this actually look like? Well, guerrilla warfare features small unit action that primarily targets an enemy's combat effectiveness. Guerrilla warfare targets an enemy's logistics. We think about the U.S. Army. It's heavily dependent on being resupplied. And the higher the op tempo, the higher the operational tempo, the more it's reliant on support systems, on combat support and combat service support. So if guerrillas were to disrupt those supply lines, then the army is going to run out of the things that they need. So logistics might also include transportation. Large armies are moved often by wheeled vehicles. You take out those vehicles 
even if you just score a mobility kill, then you've taken out an important piece of equipment on the battlefield. And this is what guerrillas do. They target mobility, they target logistics, supply lines, they target lines of communication. Now, back in the day, it used to be if you disrupted telegraph lines, then units would have uh, little communication. Today, you knock out some satellite dishes on some base somewhere, and all of a sudden, these military units don't have SATCOMs. They don't have satellite communications anymore, upon which they are highly reliant. So guerrillas attack these lines of communication because it degrades the combat effectiveness of these primarily conventional military units. Guerrillas target an enemy's will to fight and their morale. They target the industrial capacity and other targets. So instead of trying to annihilate your enemy's forces directly on the battlefield, guerrillas disrupt the ability to fight by targeting their enemy's support systems. And that, in turn, makes the enemy's forces easier to fight because large armies are heavily dependent on support. They need to be resupplied. If those support systems aren't there, then these forces become easier to fight. It's like breaking the shaft of the spear instead of trying to break the spearhead. Now, lots of people talking about guerrilla warfare, they focus on guns and tactics. That is one part. That's actually not the largest part of a guerrilla war, as I'll explain in a few minutes. In guerrilla warfare, the, the guerrilla side is heavily reliant on intelligence. It, it's reliant on its own logistics and mobility, transportation, supply. It's reliant on information operations, and subversion. And I will explain why all these things are critically important in guerrilla warfare. But first, let's break down what this guerrilla side actually looks like. This is the three-part insurgency model. You have guerrilla forces up top. That is the, the tip of the spear. That's the direct action part of this. You have the auxiliary and you have the underground. Now, guerrilla warfare isn't just guerrillas. In fact, guerrilla forces are the smallest part of an insurgency believe it or not, it's actually just a small fraction of the overall effort. Now, if we look at historical guerrilla conflicts, we're looking at less than 20% of an insurgency is actually made up of guerrilla forces. And up to 80%, sometimes more, consists of the auxiliary and the underground. And that's where we get this thing called the tooth to tail ratio. The tooth being the fighters and the tail being the support. Well, the tooth to tail ratio for the army historically is something like seven to one. That's seven support personnel for every one combat arms personnel. In Iraq and Afghanistan, it was probably something more like 20 or 30 to one. 20 to 30 support personnel for every one trigger puller, infantry guy, whatever combat arms unit you're supporting. So I say all of that to say this. There are lots of people who talk about guerrilla warfare and guerrilla tactics. And if they don't understand this right here, if they don't understand what this model looks like, then they really are doomed to failure. And I'll explain why in just a minute. But let's look at these parts of the insurgency in a little bit greater detail. Now, who does the fighting? Well, an extremely small percentage actually does the fighting. We're talking about those actually involved in this effort. It's difficult to judge just what percentage of the populace actually engaged in violence in Iraq or Afghanistan at any given point. But suffice it to say that that number actually involved in the fighting was very small. So there was a government report from September 2017, and they estimated that the strength of the Taliban ranged from 25 to 35,000 fighters. And that represents really the height of this conflict. So even if all those fighters were Afghans, which the likelihood is that they were not all Afghans, the percentage of the population involved in fighting would be around 0.1% at any given time. 0.1% of Afghans actually involved in fighting. The number of fighters in the Chechen insurgency at any given time was probably less than that. At the height of the Bosnian War, probably 1% of the Serb population were actively fighting at any one time. Around 1.5% of the Croat population was actively involved in the fighting at the same time. And there are countless other examples of civil wars and ethnic and sectarian conflicts where extremely small parts of the population actually do the fighting. Now, these guerrilla forces, be it as small as they are, they are conducting offensive direct action. They are conducting raids and ambushes. They have to be highly mobile. They have to be in really great physical shape to be able to carry this out. The higher their op tempo, the more damage they are probably doing. And what the guerrillas want to do is break the initiative of their opponent. We have this thing called the initiative of battle. And whoever has the initiative is making the offensive decisions. 
And so what guerrillas want to do is steal that initiative away from their enemy and force the enemy to be defensive and reactionary instead of being able to go on the offense. Maybe you've heard the saying, action beats reaction nine times out of ten. And that really is the maxim for guerrilla forces. Guerrilla forces don't want to be put into a position where they are always on the defensive. Now, guerrilla forces are also heavily dependent on support. And in just a minute, I'll get into the auxiliary and the underground. But first, let's look at this breakdown, this three-part insurgency model historically. So Yugoslavia, their resistance against the Nazis in the 1940s was about 20% guerrillas and 80% auxiliary and underground. In the Algerian insurgency in the 1950s to 1960s, we saw about 20% guerrillas and about 80% auxiliary and underground. In the Malayan insurgency of 1950s, we saw about 10% guerrillas and 90% auxiliary and underground. In the Greek resistance in circa 1946, we saw less than 10% guerrillas and over 90% auxiliary and underground. So there are lots of other examples here, but the point I want to make is that the guerrilla forces, the elements that are armed conducting guerrilla type activities are actually very, very low in terms of an overall percentage of a resistance or insurgent movement. Now, after the guerrilla forces, we have auxiliary support, and these people are civilians. They might be in rural or urban areas, but they're part-time volunteers. They have day jobs. They fly under the radar. They go on about their business. They're what we call clandestine. They're trying to conceal their involvement in this insurgent or guerrilla movement. They're responsible for providing logistics and transportation to these guerrilla forces. Their job is procurement and supply, like medical supplies, ammunition, spare parts, clothing, food, whatever these guerrilla fighters need. And then if guerrillas are holed up in the mountains somewhere to avoid giving away their location or maybe they're on the run from a military or law enforcement, how are these guerrillas going to be able to gather intelligence? And the answer is that they really aren't. So that's why they have auxiliary and underground support. Now, what intelligence are we talking about? Well, how many soldiers do, does the military have? And what's their manpower? And what weapons and vehicles do they have? Where is their headquarters located? Where are these soldiers patrolling? And what times are they patrolling? And when are these guys getting resupplied? And so on and so forth. Now, all this information has intelligence value just in case that guerrilla unit wants to go intercept those resupply trucks and steal all those goodies. Now, with today's ISR assets like drones and instant communications, Blue Force Tracker, so on and so forth, that becomes a little more difficult for insurgents in Iraq and Afghanistan. The auxiliary also provides safe houses. Guerrillas have to get from point A to point B. Maybe it's a multi-day journey. Where are they going to stay? Well, they may hole up in a series of safe houses until they can get to their next destination. We're talking about small units here, basically cellular, you know, groups of 12, 24. We're not talking about hundreds and hundreds of guerrillas all pooling up together. That makes them an easier target. And generally what the auxiliary does is provide operational support. The auxiliary really greases the wheels of the guerrillas so that the guerrillas can focus on conducting raids and ambushes, and the guerrillas can rely on the support of the auxiliary to provide what they need to continue their operations. And then we have underground support, and the underground is typically urban. They are civilian. They engage in clandestine activities or covert activities. They run intelligence networks. Counterintelligence is extremely important. How do you know that your guerrilla unit is not being infiltrated? How do you know that this insurgent movement doesn't have a dozen government intelligence employees behind it? How do you know that this insurgent movement doesn't have three or four people leaking information to the press or leaking information to the government, to intelligence, to law enforcement, so on and so forth? I mean, go look up how CIA hunted down Che Guevara. Guevara did not practice very good counterintelligence, and he was infiltrated and compromised, and he was eventually killed. They eventually tracked him down. And that's what bad CI gets you. That's what bad counterintelligence gets you, especially against a well-funded and determined adversary. Now, information operations and propaganda is a central task of the underground. According to the government, guerrillas are terrorists. They're dangerous. They shouldn't be trusted. And they could jump out and kill you at any given moment. And they're going to steal your kids away and press your son into being a child soldier. And so by messaging all these things, the government encourages the public to provide information on the guerrillas. 
So if a guerrilla wants to win this parallel war, in other words, if they want to win the hearts and minds of the populace around them, how do they do that? Well, they need information operations. They have to get their message out, and it has to resonate with the public more so than the government's message. We look at the Taliban, who were fighting against American and international forces. They had some very pithy propaganda lines. Pashtuns, our people. These pasty white kids, they're foreign invaders. They're Christians. Islam, our religion. These people are not Muslims. They're Christians. They're here to turn this area into a, a Christian area. Or Sharia, our law. These Christian invaders are here to build a government that will rule over us. Our tribe has had tribal law and tribal governance for hundreds or thousands of years. And all of a sudden, these foreigners show up. They're trying to change that. And that is a message that resonated with those people. And with certain people, it resonated very strongly. And so the question is, how can the guerrillas have a message that gains them the support? Because we talk about intelligence, and really what we're saying is that Every single person alive is a sensor. They hear things, they see things, they experience things. And if these guerrillas are surrounded by a populace, or if this insurgent movement is surrounded by people who are reporting on their activities and their whereabouts to a counterinsurgent or government intelligence force, then the survivability of the average guerrilla just went way down. But if the guerrillas are surrounded by a populace who are informing the guerrillas of government and law enforcement movements, say in Iraq or Afghanistan, then all of a sudden the survivability of the guerrillas just went up. This is very much a game of cat and mouse. And I harp on this to say, if people are trying to talk about guerrilla warfare and they don't understand the actual operational support that enables actual guerrilla warfare, if you don't have that down to a T and you don't understand everything in actually involved in this conflict, then those chances of success go down drastically. And then the underground is also tasked with sabotage and subversion, cutting rail lines, robbing banks for money, throwing wrenches into the machines at factories, pouring sugar into the gasoline tanks of government and military vehicles, so on and so forth. These are the types of activities that the underground is doing. And really what happens is when all three of these triangles are acting in unison, that's really what creates an effective guerrilla movement. Until you have all, th all three parts of this triangle, you don't have an effective guerrilla movement. You just have a bunch of pissed off guys with rifles. And if a bunch of pissed off guys with rifles is all a guerrilla movement has, then it's very easy to turn public opinion against those terrorists. Let's look at Eric Robert Rudolph, the guy that bombed those abortion clinics. He went up into Western North Carolina and he was able to hide out for a long time. Why? Because he was hiding around people who supported what he did. They were militantly anti-abortion. And so they said, hey, we're not going to turn you in. And that's one reason why he was able to hide out for so long. And so without having that popular support of the, in the area where he is hiding out, he, he would have been arrested a long time before he was. Now, do we understand why intelligence and counterintelligence, logistical support, information operations, and subversion is so important now to guerrilla warfare? You don't have a guerrilla war unless you have auxiliary and underground support. Now, let's move on because I want to shift this focus just a little bit. And we're going to look at the phases of revolutionary conflict. So these essentially come from Mao Zedong, and he described these three phases of his revolutionary movement. There was phase one, latent and incipient phase. He was agitating. They were recruiting, organizing. They were building a mass movement, getting ready to begin conducting violence. And then you get into phase two, this progressive expansion. That's when you start to see direct action, raids on supplies, shaping operations, taking out reactionary leaders or reactionary elements. That goes on for some time and until you build a movement that's large enough, until you attain this critical mass where you can move on to phase three, which is these guerrilla units slowly become more conventional as they clear and hold more territory. They institute a government and they become the established power in the region. And according to Mao, these are the three phases of revolutionary conflict. I'm going to move on and I'm going to make a very critical point, And it is imperative that you think about this. In previous videos, I've talked about how the left probably plans to win the war without going to war. We've talked about this concept of a bloodless revolution. The left has taken over the education system. They influence pop culture. They control most of the media, the financial institutions. We're talking about leftist social power and influence, the soft power. 
That's why I included an entire module on soft power in the last video. Leftists have been building soft power for decades. They've been expanding their influence. I mean, we just saw one man who represents an entire social justice movement and a product offering from a $16 billion company. I'm talking about Colin Kaepernick and this Betsy Ross flag shoe and Nike, a $16 billion company. One person who is backed by millions of people, influenced a $16 billion company to continue redefining what symbols are socially acceptable. That's soft power. The point I've been trying to make in previous videos is that while conservatives are focused on electing a president and winning elections, leftists have continued their generally bloodless revolution. That's why Democrats have been attacking not Republicans directly, but that's why they've been attacking the electorate which I will explain right now. Let's look back at the three phases of revolutionary conflict and determine where we are now. Now, the Communist Party was founded in 1919. For about a decade before and about a decade later, there were dozens, maybe hundreds, of socialist strikes. There was civil unrest. There were bombing campaigns in the United States being conducted by these leftists. There were communists and socialists who were organizing a revolution, and they were eventually taken down by the FBI's radical division. These movements were largely discredited. Over 100 Communist Party USA members were arrested and charged with tax fraud. They basically brought down the entire organization. And then the FBI went around and got a bunch of Socialist Workers Party members fired from their jobs, basically shut them down as well, saying, hey, these people are violent subversives. You should not employ these people. And then they get fired. So what did these leftists do in response? Well, in 1933, they elected a socialist president. His name was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He started the New Deal, and they have used government power as a vehicle for incremental socialism ever since. Then in the 1960s, there was this cultural revolution and a lot of socialist and communist sympathizers. In 18 months, between 1970 and 1971, Leftist revolutionary groups set off 2,500 bombs across the United States. This is according to FBI statistics. This is where we got weathermen, the Weather Underground, Students for Democratic Society, Black Liberation Army, Symbionese Liberation Army, the FALN, United Freedom Front, and lots of other leftist revolutionary groups. I mean, these people thought that they were on the cusp of a major revolution. But the problem is, is that that revolution is still going on today. Then the leftists moved into phase two, this progressive expansion phase. Not a violent revolutionary activity, but they began moving into pop culture and into news and into the media, into education, into the government, now into big tech. And the Obama administration was a huge turning point in this. He promised to, quote unquote, fundamentally transform America. What is that if not a bloodless revolution? The point in all of this is that while conservatives have been focused on winning elections by banning abortion and cutting taxes, these leftists have continued their bloodless revolution. They have focused on winning elections through asymmetrical means. This is their political guerrilla war, not attacking conservatives directly, but attacking the support systems that a conservative majority relies on. We've seen the progressive growth of free stuff. If you just vote for Democrats, we're seeing mass immigration. We can't even deport the illegal aliens that we have here now. And lots of people have asked, lots of people have left this comment and it bears repeating, what have conservatives actually conserved? Because leftists have taken over or undermined traditionally conservative institutions. Parts of the American Christian Church and the Boy Scouts are great examples of some traditionally conservative institutions that have swung left. And so these people are just going to keep knocking down these dominoes until they own every one of them. This is what the leftist bloodless revolution looks like. It's been being waged against you all along. Most people just haven't figured it out yet. But more and more people are figuring this out. Now, I'm reminded of a tweet. This is actually my favorite tweet on earth because he nails it. He doesn't lie about it. He's spot on a thousand percent. He is at, he is correct. This tweet by Walid Shaheed. He works for Justice Democrats. He helped get Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez elected. And he knows very well what's going on when he writes, the old America is dying. A new America is struggling to be born. Now is a time of monsters. And what I want to explain is that there's a guerrilla war that's already being waged against you. And those of us on the right who have been so focused on buying guns and ammo, which is this stand of last resort, there's been such a focus on hard power 
that few until now have actually realized what's going on. And that is the right has decreasing means of soft power. Mainstream conservatism remains absolutely clueless. These conservative boomers as a generation and in general, not all of them, but on the whole, they've seeded this fight and they've allowed the left to institutionalize their own power through government expansion. And now the left is attacking the electorate. And the problem is, is that lots of Republicans, including Republican presidents, have 100% been a part of the problem. And now we have these younger generations waking up. And here's the reality. I myself, I'm in my early 30s. We are going to have to pay for the sins of the father. We're going to learn the hard way what happens to dying societies and cultures. Because it's not the leftist society that's dying. It's our own. Every year, every decade, every generation... We are fewer and fewer in number. And a new America is struggling to be born. Walid Shahid is right. Now will be a time of monsters. And I think that's what we're going to get. Now I'm going to do one more video in this series. And then I'll move on to another series, which is going to be much more useful than this series. A lot of people have asked, well, what do we do in response? How can we prepare for this? I'm going to answer all those questions. In part five, I'm going to cover some thoughts and implications about military involvement, in future conflicts. I'm going to take an alternative look at some assumptions made about law enforcement. I'm going to talk about gun confiscation and potential triggers of regional conflict. Now, just to reiterate, I don't see millions of Americans choosing sides to fight in a nationwide conflict. I think what's more likely is that we have lots of small conflicts in these very politically contentious zones across the country. What we're looking at are low intensity conflicts that I think are eventually going to lead to balkanization, not a national level civil war. And I'll continue to make that case in the next video. I don't have a Patreon, but I do run a website called forwardobserver.com. I write daily and weekly intelligence reports explaining what's going on in this low intensity conflict. And then I also provide online intelligence and security training. So if you're concerned about a natural disaster or some SHTF event like an economic collapse and you want to help organize your community and keep your community safe and secure, I'm teaching a lot of the skills that are involved in that process. I would appreciate your support for what I do and I will get part five of this series online here in the next week or so. Until next time, stay out front.